plucked it, it wiggles down, as you see here. Um, this is in microseconds, so the period of this is about a microsecond. It's oscillating at about a megahertz. And we have enough signal to noise to just record the, the rate gaps. Um, so there's, once you do this, you can do all kinds of experiments to tell the difference between T2 and T1 and NMR parlance uh, phase. Uh, Phasing versus loss of energy in the system, et cetera, et cetera. I won't bore you with that, but I'll just instead show you uh, a demonstration of the power of this technique, uh, which is this, this little thing that I've shown down here, um, which is actually a series of spectra. So I, take the, I do this, I take the Fourier transform, I plot it this way, and this is that, and you'll become more clear what it is um, here. Of the, this is the, where the light comes in, it goes around and it goes out. Here are the two probes and the nanotube is between them. And the probes can be far enough away and the nanotube may be 10 microns long so that the probes are not in the near field of the, of the ring resonator they stay out of the light. So the, the way the measurement goes is, so this is, this is no nanotubes. This is just the measurement of a ring resonator. If you look at the light propagating through the system, this one doesn't have the fiber next to it as a function of the, the frequency of the laser, and you see a series of resonances that correspond to cases where you, you excite the resonance modes of this cavity. So we're gonna monitor what these things are doing as we bring the nanotube into the near field of the system. And so that's sort of illustrated here, where I, I bring the nanotube in and I monitor this resonance, and I see that it, uh, it shifts dramatically, the Q gets worse, the, it's scattering light out of the resonator, et cetera. So there's a one-to-one -one mapping of the optically measured properties of this cavity uh, to the position of the carbon nanotube. And you know, it's worth thinking about this for just a second. It's kind of cool. Um, it means that you know a nanotube has an optical cross-section of about 10 to the minus 4. Uh, that's really small. Uh, but if you make the light go past it 10 to the 4 times, it has an optical cross-section of order 1. I mean, it scatters you know, half the light that is incident. And again, that's what you're seeing here. This is not a small effect. You change the, the light intensity transmitted through the system from 0.75 to 0.55. It's a big effect that, uh, that you see in this experiment, which means that it's going to be a sensitive measurement of displacement. If the nanotube just moves a little bit, you're going to notice it. And in fact, what you can do in this experiment is just park the nanotube at a certain place, like it's shown on the right, and just look at the output light. You take that output light, you put it through a fast photodiode and into a spectrum analyzer, and you just see the entire spectrum of the motion of the nanotube uh, with no work at all. That's what's applied here. This is the, 
what comes out from, again, an all optical measurement of the nanotube as a function of frequency. And here's the fundamental. That's what we saw before. This is vibrating, in this case, at about 2 or 3 megahertz. But now you actually see all the harmonics, all the other modes. And again, this is, this is undriven. This is just the thermal motion of the nanotube. Uh, with measured with enough sensitivity that you can just sort of see the whole spectrum all at once. And again, this is something that you couldn't do before with existing techniques. All of our old techniques for measuring these resonances involved mixing of the high frequency signal down to low frequency, which were very poor bandwidth, et cetera, et cetera. So we're having a lot of fun with this, and I think we're going to be able to do a lot of cool science. And I'm not going to go into that in detail, but just to mention to you, that, uh, for example, if you're interested in optomechanics, where the mechanical degree of freedom interacts with the optical degrees of freedom, uh, there's something they want to get to called the strong coupling limit, where basically the quantum fluctuations of the mechanical degree of freedom dramatically shift the optical properties. And again, the way to do that is you need a low mass resonator. There's no way around it. Uh, and so we think we have a much better shot of getting to the strong coupling limit than any other <coughs> that I know about with the possible exception of certain AMO type systems where you have a chain of atoms that are And I'll mention again that this system is very nonlinear and these springs are very soft. So cool things can happen. This is very preliminary, but I'll show you an example of a spectrum measured. Uh, so this is again the power spectrum as a function of frequency. So there's the fundamental vibrational mode of this device, which is again at about, in this case, about 500 kilohertz. It's an even longer piece. And what all I'm going to do is lower the nanotube more and more into the optical field so the coupling between the, the nanotube and the optics grows. And there will start to be feedback between them that will cause weird stuff to happen. And in fact, as I do that, <laughs> this is just a teaser. As I start to do that, you start to generate all these uh, super harmonics and even subharmonics. Uh, basically, this is the, the oscillating pen, nonlinear pendulum problem writ, uh, written in a carbon banana tube, and you start to see all these higher harmonic generations exploding all over the map. And so we think it's going to be really fun to explore this in detail uh, in the future. So that, that, that's all well and good. That's fun. Uh, we play playing around with our guitar, but, you know, little real world. Oops. You know, this was my goal. I wanted this. And while a nanotube guitar is pretty cool, and playing the Cornell, I think they, they used our, our, our Cornell alma mater for the 150th uh, anniversary of Cornell's founding uh, over the weekend. So that's awesome. But, you know, come on. We're just still playing games. We're not really engaging the deep problem of how do we build uh, a, nanos a real nanoscale machine technology. What would that look like? And so uh, after our little interlude of having fun, we're back to this question of how am I going to build uh, nanoscale machines? And you can say, well, make this a carbon nanotube and have it fold up into something. I have no idea how to do that, so I won't do that. But there is another thing that's not so different that may give one a little bit of hope in the short term about how to use a strategy that looks more like this. And that is this. So this is a sheet of paper that's got a bunch of fold lines on it. See where I'm going. This is the origami. We fold the paper in a certain way, and you can realize a given three-dimensional structure. And it's really easy. I think most of you in the audience can probably tell from staring at this what it's going to fold into, right? For sure. That's right. It's an elephant. Right? <laughs> um, so, so this is actually a, a really fantastic technology, where you take a two-dimensional material and you create an arbitrary, not an arbitrary, but a really interesting three-dimensional structure. And, and this is a static structure, but you know you can make ones that move, too, that, that know how to bend and what have you. And, and it's a great design problem. It's, a, it's an interesting inverse problem. If somebody gives you the elephant, you can unfold it and figure out where the folds are. But if you just, they just give you the blank sheet of paper and a picture of an elephant, it's not so trivial to figure out how to do it. Although now, actually, there are computer algorithms that will tell you how to fold arbitrary polygon shapes. So it's really, you know, so stop thinking of this in art and start thinking of it as technology. It's really an interesting way of realizing three-dimensional structures out of two-dimensional material. In fact, I've been at MIT since Thursday because I was attending something called um, the 
uh, Active Matter Summit, which was over, uh, over the weekend, uh, which was a bunch of people that were sort of aimed at, at realizing the promise of, of this kind of stuff as a technology. Um, in fact, uh, I, I encourage you, if this topic would interest you to travel back in time and go to this, it's <laughs> really awesome. Was anybody there? Anybody go to this? All right, so, so this is a crime, just so you know. This was so interesting and would have been so fascinating, but nobody in this world knew about it, even though it was happening at the, at the media lab. So we need to get better information flow than we need Because there were some of the greatest speakers I've ever seen on that stage, and the room was half empty a lot of the time. So it was really brilliant. Uh, and for example, uh, you, many of you may know this, you have one of the best origami artists slash scientists in the, in the world here. Eric Dumain is in the computer science department, who, uh, if you watch this documentary, you'll learn a little bit about him and his daughter, uh, who are very, very interesting characters, um, and are very interested in exploring uh, these kinds of ideas for the use in, in both art and in technology. And this, this approach is, is invading everything. Uh, people who are thinking about deploying a, a satellite uh, arrays, they think about these solving problems. Uh, doing convinced matter physics, people are very curious about it. Uh, if you want to make steps for medicine, you want to make something that goes in small and gets big. Um, people are thinking it's not obvious because there's no science bar, but this is sort of at the 100 micron scale. People are making uh, swellable polymers that know how to fold themselves up into interesting shapes. And it's really fascinating. In our meeting, had everybody from architects down to DNA origami people, and they all had a lot to say to each other. Not always true for these cross-disciplinary meetings. And, and the reason is, and I think this is maybe the most important message in this talk, is that um, that an origami scale, it's really just geometry, these folding problems. If you keep the thickness of the material and the length the same size, it all works. It's like electronics. We know a, we have a well-defined pathway to scale things from the macro scale problems down to the nano scale. <coughs> now, it doesn't scale forever. For example, at the smallest size scales, there are these you know, thermal fluctuations, like we were talking about with the nanotubes, which are not present in the, micros the macroscopic system. But over many orders of magnitude, the, the ideas and principles are the same, whether you're an architect or whether you're a, a material scientist working in the micro scale. So it's really cool. It's really super neat. Um, and I've just had so much fun learning about this field in the last uh, year or so. But you know, what, what's my role in this? Well, as a nano person, you know, you got to ask yourself, you know, can we do this? <laughs> <laughs> I will not be showing you this at the end of the talk, so don't get your hopes up. Uh, we're going to take baby steps. But you know, you can only scale the sheet of paper down so thin, and this is as thin as it gets. Uh, what could you build? With that? And so that'll be the last little tale I'll tell you in the next uh, ten minutes or so. And it's a, a tale with, with two pieces. This, uh, the first piece is you have to understand your starting material. And so the first question is, well, how stiff is the graphene sheet? If I'm going to bend it and fold it, uh, I need to know about. I need to know something about the paper. And it turns out there aren't good experiments on this. Uh, they're just people haven't measured it in the most direct way. We know what the atomic scale the answer. Uh, if you're a chemist, you know very much about the bending stiffness of carbon carbon bonds. Uh, if you're a solid state physicist, you know about the phonon spectra of, of, um, of graphite, et cetera, et cetera. So we know it in the limit of a perfect, of the, you know, the, you want to bend the individual bonds. But what happens if you start working with 10 or 100 micron uh, size sheets of paper of graphite? Is it the same? So we decided to explore this, and I'll, I'll start off by just showing you a little video. So this is a graphene sheet on the right that's a little bit darker, and this is a microscope slide uh, that's just a microscope slide. This is a probe, and you can push the graphene, and it kind of wrinkles and crinkles, sort of like a piece of paper. Kind of reminds you of playing a piece of paper. And then the, this is not like paper. If you reverse it, it sort of all goes back. It's kind of cool. It's, it's a elastic. It's like rubber paper. It's completely elastic uh, within reason. Um, so, so that's pretty cool. And first off, I should say how I'm doing this experiment. Um, we, we put a sacrificial layer underneath the uh, graphene, which in this case was just a thin layer of aluminum. We put the whole thing in water, then we etch out the aluminum layer so the graphene is just weakly stuck to the 
surface, and then you can push it. You have to, all the experiments I'll show you from here on out are in water, because one thing that does not scale in origami or in anything else are the surface adhesion forces. The van der Waals force scales by the area, everything else scales by the volume. At small sizes, surface adhesion forces dominate. Unless you put it in liquid, because then the liquid sort of system is happy to be around the liquid, it's not. So we throw some surfactants in to fix things up a little bit, and off we go. It's, it's a trivial but important point. I don't know of a nanotechnology Physical nanotechnology that doesn't work in the water. Uh, biology, it's all in water. Because you have to control the surface forces or you're doing that part does not scale. Okay, so this is just a bare sheet. Um, you can also make things that, that um, you know, at the beginning of this talk would have looked like transistors, but now they've become cantilevers. So these are gold pads with little strips of graphene. Graphene absorbs about 2% of the light incident upon it. So uh, you can just barely see it if you turn up the contrast from the microscope. That's why the gold looks dark. And the graphene, you can just, just make that. Um, I mentioned this already. Uh, we have an aluminum layer for release. Um, and we throw in some surfactant to, to clean things up. Uh, and now let's say we want to measure what the bending stiffness of a graphene sheet is. Pretty easy. You just pick one of these things up. That's the piece at the end. You notice it looks like it's bent down. You can change the focus on the microscope to see how much is bent down and read off how many microns you had to adjust the focus to see. And now you know how much the thing is reflected. So it's an extraordinarily difficult and complicated experiment <laughs> and then followed by extraordinarily difficult and complicated math. Uh, the gravity pulling down on this that gives you a displacement. I told you how to measure that. Force over displacement gives you a spring constant, you're done. That's the whole experiment. <laughs> we were doing great fancy techniques for a long time, and at some point this, I said, I said, what's going on with your cantilevers? They're all hanging down. They said, yeah, they're hanging down in gravity. We said, oh, well, let's use that to measure the spring <coughs> Before we were doing thermal fluctuations. And all that <coughs> stuff. Uh, a couple of points. They move microns with piconews. So the scale of the spring constant is a piconewton per micron or a Micronewton per meter. Uh, to put that in context, an AFM cantilever might be, say, 10 newtons per meter. So this is, say, a million times softer than your average AFM cantilever. In fact, it's closer to the spring constants that you get in optical traps. I'll say a little bit more about that. Uh, but for the purposes of this experiment, we just wanted to measure these spring constants as a function of the size of the cantilevers. <coughs> so we did a whole bunch of measurements, and we found that the Spring constant on the log scale versus how long the cantilever was for a given width. I think these were all something like one wide. We measured them using a bunch of different techniques. We got a bunch of different data that has a lot of scatter, but as you make the cantilevers longer, they get softer, roughly as L cubed, like they're supposed to. <coughs> basically, this line, the fit to this line, gives you the bending stiffness of graphene, the two dimensional bending stiffness of the membrane. You extract a number. Um, and then you can compare it to that microscopic number that I told you we all know. This is the prediction of the microscopic number. Um, that's not good. This is a log scale. You're only off by three orders of magnitude. <laughs> so, so even though these things are really soft, I told you they're a million times softer than an AFM cantilever, they're still a thousand times stiffer than we thought they were going to be. Uh, so that was initially a big shock. But in hindsight, it's not a big shock. Um, and the reason it's much stiffer when it's big, uh, the simple version is, is shown here. Um, crumpled paper is stiffer than flat paper. Uh, crumpled paper gets much stiffer. Effectively, it gets thicker. Bending stiffness scales like the thickness cube. So you don't have to get much thicker, and things get a lot stiffer. Um, so you know, the atomic scale picture looks something more like this than what I showed you. This sent us off on a little journey um, to understand where these fluctuations were coming from. There are two flavors of them. There's thermal fluctuations. They could just be vibrating because of thermal fluctuation. And there's a, a literature that tells us all about this that was written in the 1990s, uh, thinking about biological systems, but they were really doing a theory for graphene. They just didn't know it. Uh, they made very explicit predictions. And in fact, if you crank through the numbers, <coughs> this is a huge effect. 
effect. This, this thermal fluctuation should stiffen the membrane by a thousand times. So we were really happy. We thought the story was over. Uh, and then we made the mistake of doing more experiments and discovered that there were also static fluctuations. So this is, a, this is a, basically a Newton rings experiment on the graphene layer on the surface. We're looking at the, the light that backscatters off the graphene and interferes with light that backscatters off the, gra off the glass. So every light dark ring here is about a <coughs> quarter of the wavelength of light. Uh, and so it turns out there's about 80 nanometers of static fluctuations on the micron scale whose origins we do not know but can measure. Um, there are theories for crumpled sheets, also from a lot of the same people, David Nelson figuring prominently in uh, both theories. And this also, uh, the measured scale of it matches reasonably well with the kinds of numbers that we set. So the net result is we do have a sheet of paper. It's crumpled paper. So it's not quite as soft as we thought, but it's still paper. In fact, if you compare it, actually, it's, it, it acts a lot more like regular paper, like an 8 half by 11 sheet of paper in terms of its mechanical properties, which is sort of what we uh, had physically figured out from this blank. Okay, last topic. And I'll make it quick. It's mostly pictures. Um, I'm, I still haven't done any cured origami for you. And I have a problem because I can't make a fold. It's graphene, it's one atom thick, there's no, you know, a fold is somehow an inelastic structure. Something has to break or move or, you know, you can't do it with a single sheet unless you do chemistry. And no offense, but I don't know anything about chemistry and nor do I care to learn. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I do care to learn, but it's a whole other project to do mechanochemistry to, to, to modify chemically at the bottom. Uh, but there is a way out. Uh, which is this so-called kirigami. Uh, there's a if you're if you're really you know a radical in the origami world, you get out your scissors and you start cutting the paper. Immediately <laughs> <laughs> disowned by a large quantity of the community, uh, but then you go have fun. And one thing is you can make pretty interesting structures that only bend, that there are no folds required. Uh, for example, in honor of Hook, you can make a spring uh, or more complex uh, springs, and we've made versions of all of these. So off you go. And so the last thing I'll show you, I'll show you a couple of examples of kirigami. So this is that kirigami spring. So we first make the paper model, play with that, and it's really fun. If you've never played with one of these things, they're really enjoyable. There's actually cool stuff that happens that they, they camp out of the plane, and so there's a spontaneous symmetry break that happens, and it can happen in different directions, and you can get solid on the boundary. Anyway, if you're a physicist, you can play with one of these things all afternoon and have a great time. Um, and then you can go over the, the CNF and you can make one out of graphene and you can do exactly the same thing with the graphene version. Uh, and the amazing thing is, is you can do it all day. It'll just, as long as you don't pull it too far, you can bend this thing and uh, stretch this thing until you pull it in the face. Uh, the spring constant is about, again, on this one, it's on the order of 10 to the minus 7 meters per meter, very, very soft spring, uh, and, and very, very robust. Also, you know, just to change the focus and image the structure of this thing, in this case, we pulled it up a little bit, and you can see oh, there's a bacterium running around. You can see <laughs> uh, what the thing looks like, and in fact, uh, compare it. Compare it to the oops, compare it to the paper model, and it looks. This is the the reconstructed data from that stack that I showed you. Processing. This is a picture of the paper model, and you can compare them, and they look really similar. And this isn't just fluff. It's this thing I was telling you about before. Uh, this stuff is all scale invariant if you scale everything in the right way. And so it turns out for this size of graphene device, it is very much like regular old fashioned paper. Uh, now, just to loop back to the beginning, this thing is a transistor. It's not just a mechanical structure. You can measure its conducting properties in the unstretched state and in the stretch state, and this is the conductance versus the potential of the electrolyte around it. It looks the same because you haven't really done anything but just kind of changed the macroscopic structure. So it's an extremely soft bit of electronics. So we were talking about John Rogers before. He wants to make uh, electronics that you can tattoo on your skin. 
we want to make electronics that you can tattoo on a cell. Uh, if it's soft enough that it can interact with a single cell and, and not cause too much trouble. Um, I think I'll skip over the next little thing. Um, we can also act actuate these things magnetically. So this is a little magnet here instead of a gold pad. And then you can play with the magnet underneath the table and you can make it so cool. You can start to imagine building up a set of manipulation technologies that are fun. Uh, and, and maybe the most important thing that we can make is one of the most trivial. This is a graphene hinge. So there are two pads with just a little piece of graphene connected to <coughs> them, and we can open and close the hinge. Never mind how we do it. Um, we can do it for thousands of times. And it really begins to give you ideas about, hey, maybe I can start to make stuff like a very simple thing. I can make a bunch of panels that have whatever I want on it, semiconductors, optical elements, sensors, you name it. I'll connect it all on a sort of a graphing platform, and it can fold up into some structure that then I can deploy and release or do what not. And I think this is really a fun and interesting idea. Uh, and I'll skip over that and just say that, you know, what we would really like to do is to start to build using these kinds of technologies a set of platforms out of which we can make very simple nano submarines that can go interact and be the Internet of Things at the cellular level. And if you can do that, you know, you can implant them in the brain, try to report neural signals, you can implant them in the microbiome and try to give them information about uh, what's going on with space and time. Uh, maybe you can put them in raindrops and put them in clouds and then see where they go. Uh, I think it would be super fun to try to push these things down to the level that we have semi-autonomous things that can report on, on the world at the cellular scale. And if you go ask these people what they most want in life, this is what they want. If you ask microbiome people, they want something that gives them local information about what's happening in their communities. If you have brain initiative, you, you don't want to put ice picks in people's heads to record neural signals, you would like to do something small, that's implantable, et cetera, et cetera. So we think these are like little tiny steps along that direction. And I'll, I'll end with a bit of wisdom that I think the other super interesting thing about trying to build these nanoscale machines is characterized by what was on time and the that died. die. Um, but he said two things. He says, I want to know how to solve every problem that has been solved. That's just rude. <laughs> but anybody could possibly want to know that. But more to the point, he said, what I cannot create, I do not understand. And I think we won't really understand how things work at the micro and nanoscale until we start building our own systems at the scale. And that will be just a tremendous amount. So with that, I will uh, say thank you and be happy to take the questions.
when you look at the thermal fluctuations and the core of the 